This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. This is a conversation for the ages featuring one of Extreme Metal's originals, Michael Amet from Arch Enemy, Carcass and Spiritual Beggars. The catalyst for the conversation is an Australian tour from Arch Enemy, but I won't read out the dates because I've got bugger all listeners in my home country. If you live here, please just go to Gig Guides. The venues and the dates are easily found. The important thing is throughout this chat here, we discuss Carcass. We dive deep. We go way back in time. Necroticism, Heartwork. We talk all about those albums. We discuss why he left Carcass. What it was like working with Bill, Bill Steer, one of the greatest extreme metal guitarists ever. I mean, these two together. Fair dinkum, how good are they? Candlemas, I bet you didn't know that he played guitar on a Candlemas album, but he did. His memories of Gigantura across Australia in 2006. Frederick Nordstrom, the Uber producer, the Gothenburg Uber producer from the 90s and early 2000s. So many topics we cover here. Michael's a fantastic fella. If I had more time, because it sounded like Michael had more time to give me, I would have taken it, but the conversation took place at 4.30 p.m. And I've got two kids, you see, and I could hear them running amok with their cousin in the background, and I thought I'd better get back out to them. But uh, needless to say, this is still a conversation that is well worth your while, particularly if you don't understand or aren't aware of Michael's contribution to extreme metal. It's all here throughout this chat. I don't have a song to share with you because please just go across to Spotify and check out those two albums, Necroticism and Heartwork, and of course a new one from Arch Enemy, Deceivers. It's all good stuff, but those early things that he did with Carcass, they really laid the groundwork, and I'll talk about why in this episode. So let's get to it. Here he is, Michael Amit. Michael, I can hear you. How are you? Cool. I'm great. How are you? Good, good, yeah, great. Thanks, thanks for taking the time to join me, mate. I know it's uh, you're on the road, and these sort of things come up, and uh, you know I, they might feel like an obligation. They're really good for fans like me, though. You know, <laughs> hopefully not just you. There's some people listening as well at some point or reading or whatever this is for. Listening, yeah, I've got a podcast, <laughs> so it'll yeah, pod, you great, know, great, you, awesome. YouTube, all the rest of it. Yeah, it's uh, you're one of those guitarists. I've got to say that I've been looking forward to having a chat for some time. So that's awesome too. Uh oh, there we go. <laughs> I like that. Oh, I haven't had that response before. Actually, I had it once. I had it once when I was, I'm a bassist. If you can see me behind me, so I play guitar too. But uh, I'm an I'll, I'll out myself now. I'm an old Carcass fan. So there you go. Uh oh, <laughs> here we okay. go. No, that's cool, man. I appreciate it. I'm just I'm just messing with you. No, good. that's cool. Great. Well, we'll, We'll get to that. We'll get to that because I've got a few questions. I I, I grilled Bill Steer, so you're next. <laughs> it's coming. Oh shit. <laughs> well, we can let's kick off on that now. Why don't we do that now? I've long described Necroticism as being a perfect album. Um, and I feel like Heartwork laid the platform for what heavy metal would sound like for decades. Now when you were writing those albums, particularly Heartwork, did you feel like as though you were doing something that would be described as revolutionary? Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> right, so it did feel like as though you were doing something that was going to... I mean, it's a long time ago. So that's I have to say that. But I do remember that it felt like the next uh, the next step. That's exactly what it was, particularly with Heartwork, because you can't... All modern metal has elements Something of that going on the minute. sound. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me okay, mate? Can it kind of go? got a bit weird, the sound. Did you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. There might be... I hope, I've got NBN, which is our version of fiber optic internet here, so I shouldn't have too many issues on my... I'm going to do a speed test quickly just to see if there's some mm. sort of an issue, but hopefully there isn't. Um, oh, there might be a bit of an issue with mine. Oh, no, it's creeping up now. Yeah, it's going up to 80, 90 meg. Yeah, there you go. It just took a bit. All the kids... It's 4.30 here, you say, or well, 4.50, so all the kids are coming home from school. You know what they're like. They get on their Xboxes and stuff. <laughs> 
you know. But um, <laughs> if, you, if you can hear me now, I mean, I just wanted to give you that feedback that, I mean, you you, re, you recorded, uh, I understand you're in Arch Enemy and you've been in Arch Enemy for the majority of your career, but those Carcass albums, they laid the platform. That's it. Uh, yeah, for sure. It was a huge deal. I mean, especially looking back at the time, we were just going through it, you know, and I was in the band for three years, I think. Hmm. I did two albums and an EP with them, and a lot of touring and stuff like that. So that was, that was in the early 90s. Really cool experience. And, you know, I have them, I, th- I thank them every time I meet them and we have a few drinks. I always thank them for the opportunity because it was like, I mean, they needed a guitar player. And, uh, but I, you know, it changed my life really as well and they i i got it i got the possibility to get, to get involved in the in the songwriting which was very cool of them you know so it was uh and uh if you go back you asked if it, we felt that it was a revolutionary death or something like you said on the yeah. artwork right i think we we that was a band that was a kind of a progressive band actually on caucus i think that was the definition of true progressive metal because every album was completely different there was a real progression there so there was, you know, there was a the first album, and then the second album, and the third album that was I was on, and then the, the fourth album, Hard Work. I mean, yeah, those, those albums all sound really, really different. There's a huge leap between between every album, right? Yeah, and they're all good in their own way, I think. So uh, I mean, I remember writing when we were jamming on the the, the Hard Work stuff, and I remember some things being totally new, like the. Mm-hmm. Like I presented like a little riff to uh, Bill, um, the harmony part. Is it this mortal coil with this harmony part? Mm-hmm. So like, and then we, and then Bill added the the harmony on there, and and uh, you know we had this galloping drum beat, and the it was just like, I mean. I did, I was I remember thinking at the time, and this is a strong memory I have, is that uh, I've never heard anything like this in death metal before. Like it's like do, it's mixing, it's blending in like you know, I made and type harmony and galloping yeah. beats with, and that had never been done before to my knowledge. And I was pretty deep into the the death metal scene at that time. So I was remember thinking, I remember do remember thinking like this is going to be weird. Maybe people are going to hate it because it's not what people consider death metal, you know. <laughs> So, but, the t- but then I didn't really think more. I don't think we were thinking that we were, I can't speak for the others, but I think, you know, we were just doing our thing and it was kind of very free and open spirit in the band at the time. It was like very, you know, it was very uh, forward thinking in a way. It was great. Very, one yeah. of the best experiences, you know. Why did you end up leaving Carcass? What was the catalyst for your exit? Uh, a few different things. It all led up to that point, I guess, and uh, yeah, led me to that point. And I think one of them was that I wanted to do my own. I wanted to, I had contributed a lot more ideas to hard work than on the previous album, of course, but uh, I I don't know. I just felt like I wanted more control of the music, how it was going to be the end up being, you know, I wanted to be more in control, I guess. I wanted to run my own my own thing, which is what I've done since then. Mm. You mentioned progressive and yeah, absolutely. That's, that's such a, people think of progressive and they think of yes and Jethro Tull and all that sort of stuff. But really when progressive is just constant change and usually forward change, it's not repeating yourself and writing a no prayer for the dying, this sort of thing. But you and you and Bill, you're so progressive that you almost progress right out of heavy metal and into hard, like this this bluesy style hard rock. You have this inclination toward rock and blues, both of you do. So he, he did Firebird and you, of course, you've got Spiritual Beggars. Now, is it conceivable to suggest that if Carcass kept going that the band may have evolved into a more bluesy enterprise? I don't think so, but I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there for the rest of it, you know. <laughs> I wasn't there for what happened after hard work, you know. And then, um, the, but I've heard a few, I have, I've heard most of Swan Song album, and I think it's, it has a bit more of a hard rock feel to it from what I remember. Uh, no? Yeah, they, yeah, I they kept remember, going. I can yeah, remember they, exactly. 
Yeah, it's. I, I would say yeah. it's not quite the masterpiece that Heartwork is, but it sort of hinted where the band would go. But but fans by then, as you probably recall, fans were really nasty toward it. They were mean spirited toward it. You know, the necroticism fans and the uh, decanting fans. The, these people um, didn't understand. But isn't it always like it's, it's, it's always like that though? You know, it's like I see that with our enemy as well. We put out a new record, or when we brought in a new singer or something like that, and they said no. Bring back the old. We want uh, just the way it was, and then, <laughs> and then by the time then a few years pass, and then they then another album that people complained about that is now the legendary album. So it's like <laughs> you can't really. I don't really spend a lot of time listening to those kind of voices at all, really, because it's uh, you know I think everybody falls. It's, I mean, it goes for everybody, right? We fall in love with a a band or a musician. Uh, you know, the style, the music, uh, at a certain age, there's a window where you get into something and then you want them to stay that the, exactly the same, just like that forever. And that's not really possible because we're all human beings and we grow and we develop and we we move forward, hopefully. Mm, yeah. I, I distinctly recall, I remember the moment when it was announced that uh, Angela or Angela was recruited as the band's vocalist. And the truth is none of us knew, meaning us, meaning us fans, we didn't even know that it was a female vocalist that was in the band based on the quality of the album. Did the mm. – you were the first band, if I'm not mistaken, to recruit a female vocalist in extreme metal. I'm sure there are other lesser lights, but I'm talking about a touring band with an international fan mm. base that's selling tens mm -hmm. of thousands of albums. Was that mm – -hmm. was the fact that Angela – was it strictly that she was the most appropriate person, vocal and as a as a vocalist and as a person that brought her into the band, or were you actually thinking along the lines of, this is going to change the game, let's bring in a female vocalist? Uh, it was the former, more than the latter, for sure. I mean, I, I, because it wasn't like you said, it wasn't a proven formula. It had not really been done before at that level. But nobody... Nobody thought it was a good idea, really, <laughs> you know, from that point of view. It was just like you had this ripping voice and just like a really cool charisma on stage. And it was just like, yeah. And she was a total death metal freak, you know, so she'd grown up on her music roots were really like, you know, Carcass, Morbid Angel, Ball Thrower, you know, those kind of things, really, really heavy stuff. Hmm. And, uh, uh, death of course yeah so yeah she was just really into it and uh, you know she was a real she was a perfect fit at that time for sure yeah yeah look you are and then everything else that came on top of that was just like the the, the media attention and that was something that we hadn't really we we thought it was okay this is going to be eye-catching of course you know this is going to be cool it's going to be set us apart but we, we didn't we weren't prepared for what was you know that kind of reaction that we got which was insane you know, so it was, uh, it was yeah. you know, it was something new, something new for sure. I saw you guys in 2006 on Gigantour. Remember that when you came to Australia with uh, Megadeth? Oh, of course, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. What are your memories of that? That show, The Brisbane show, I'll actually narrow your focus onto The Brisbane show. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> I don't Oh, The Brisbane <laughs> show, yeah, it was with Soulfly was there. Correct. Yeah, that's and, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember staying at, uh, yeah, I remember everything. I mean, it was, that was a nice little tour, you know, we'd done the Megadeth, it was with Megadeth, uh, Gigant tour, right? Yeah. So we'd done that in the States first, and then we joined, and we followed on and did it in uh, Australia as well. And Soulfly joined, and I really enjoyed the Soulfly set as well, I remember. It was one of the few festivals that I've been to where I didn't think that there was a shit band on, to be honest, in terms of the performance. Every mm -hmm. every band that was on put in an enormous performance. Uh, who was who else played? Caliban. Uh, oh gosh, I remember Caliban were the first band. They're, they're a German band, I think. Caliban, uh, right? That's I've forgotten about that. But they were there. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to dive into my. Uh, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember, it, I remember, I remember it really well, and I just remember your performance. Mm. There was uh, Caliban, Arch Enemy, Megadeth, and Soulfly. That was it. So there was really, I mean, it wasn't really a festival per se, but all three mm. really big mm. bands for the time, and Caliban yeah. were up and coming. Who sort of continued on a little bit, but just not quite got up to the status you guys have but that's uh that's all right that shit happens you know but there's there's another band that you've been a part of that i, I think gets glossed over in your history when you get asked questions because i've listened to a few of your interviews but 
were you a member of Candlemass or were you just doing that album Dactylus Glomerata back in 1997? Oh, God. Uh, that's a good question. I was, I don't know. I mean, I think I remember Leif Edling, the mastermind, you know, mm. the song writer and founder of that band, of, of Candlemass. Uh, he called me. He was actually working for Swedish radio. Just, um, he was uh, working, he was like doing interviews for the music program, stuff like that. Hmm. So he'd interviewed me a couple of times uh, for another band I was doing at the time uh, back then. And then uh, in the mid 90s or whatever. And then he actually called me one day and asked if I wanted to play with him on his, uh, on his album. And he knew I was a big Candlemas fan, and from back in the eighties, I used to follow him around and see them live. And I was a big, you know, really into that sound that they had back then. And uh, I think the Candlemas had been sort of disbanded for a while, for a few years at that point. And he had another band called Abstract Algebra at the time, and I think this was supposed to be the second Abstract Algebra album. They recorded it once and failed at that or something like that. Something had happened. He wasn't happy with the production. He wanted to redo the songs, add a few more new songs and uh, re-record the whole thing. And he wanted me to play guitar on it. Mm. So, of course, that was super exciting. So I, um, it's an offer I couldn't refuse, actually. So that's one of the few times I've actually gone in and played somebody else's music, apart mm. from Carcass, of course. Other than that, it's always been, I've always done my own thing, really. So I'm not, I'm never being like a session guy or anything like that. But this was one of, I think, you know, he wanted my style and he wanted my sound and that's what he got. So. Did Leffy, did he? So, well, I don't know. We never, we never, I, we never played live with that lineup, oh, the okay. particular lineup. So I wouldn't say I was ever in Canada, no. But I so, did play on that record. That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's out there. Yeah. Uh, Killer sound. It's I mean, it's all there. It's it's a, a candle mass of sound has evolved through that period. There's no question. But w- was there discussions? You know, you get to your fifth or sixth beer, this sort of thing. Was there discussions between you and Leffy about maybe this partnership continuing on where you're actually writing material for candle mass? Uh, no, I mean he writes all the music and lyrics in that band. Yeah. It's done on every album, I believe. So this we've never. It was not a very collaborative <laughs> effort in that way, you know. <laughs> it was more just like play like this. No, not like that. More like this. So it was like you know, I was just doing what he told me to do, which is fine. I enjoyed it. You know, it was just very brief. I just recorded guitars. Like I think I was up in Stockholm for like a couple of weekends and drank a lot, partied a lot. You know, we were both single at the time and <laughs> had a lot of fun. And then. Uh, you know, by hung over in the studio recording guitars. It's, uh, it's I it. enjoy it. It was fun. Yeah, it's great. It was uh, really, really cool. Yeah. I've lost touch with him though, so I haven't talked to him in a long time. But yeah, Love, I'm, I'm still feeling. a big fan. Yeah. yeah, he's great. He's really great. We were pretty close there for a while, and uh, I continued to like. You know, he'd come down and visit me. Or I went up and visited him. You know, stuff like that. So we hung out. In a private, you know, sort of way, you know, just chilling and, and partying. Or whatever. It was a good time. Yeah. But yeah, he doesn't really collaborate in that way musically with people. As far as I know, I could be wrong. But that's what makes him great. You know, he's one of the most underrated uh, Swedish musicians, I think, or songwriters, I should call him, uh, in the metal scene, you know, because he's just created so many great songs and melodies and stuff like that. And lyrics are too. Very yeah. great musician. Yeah, I think I think Marcus yeah. did a good job with him. Marcus Shadell did a great job with him for a bit. But yeah, to your point, he sort of goes through the musicians, but that's because he's got a vision and he's trying to stick to it and find people that'll uh, help him execute on that. And so so be it. But um, he, he's another fella from your past that I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on. But uh, I was talking to Bjorn from In Flames just this morning, and I asked him the same question. Okay, about his impressions. You're talking of- to everybody, aren't you? You talk to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I try. I try. I've, you should see my bucket list, Michael. It's it's enormous. You've been on it for a long time. I write books. I write books about what I'm doing here too. So you'll be in the next one. So uh, it'll be good. Don't worry. But uh, <laughs> I love talk. I love talking to you guys because it's just been a lifelong hobby, passion. You know this sort of thing. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not really. It might sound weird. I'm not really a metalhead though. I don't look at. You can probably see my photo and stuff. I don't look like it either. I just get really interested in talking and diving into the mm-hmm. early the '90s. Remember the '90s when we didn't have the internet. And you had to buy the albums and you had to focus on the albums and read the liner notes and buy the magazines. That's that's where I come from. 
that yeah, sort of, of course, thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the question was was uh, Frederick Nordstrom. Okay, so Bjorn did a lot of work with him early on, and you, you guys did uh, four albums. Arch Enemy did four albums with Frederick. So how important was mm. he to the band's evolution? Really great. We did the first three, of course, and then the first, the uh, Wages of Sin was recorded with him, but then mixed with Andy Sneap in the UK. Then we went back and did actually a fifth record with uh, The Rise of the Tyrant with uh, Frederick as well. So, and then I've, I had another band called Spiritual Beggars, and we did like uh, four or uh, five albums great with him band. as well. So I've done yeah. a lot. Of, I've, done, I've done a lot of albums with. Uh, <laughs> I've done ten records with with Frederick over the years. But it's, it's become less and less. So we haven't worked together for a long time. I did go back and do a couple of tracks for a project called uh, that I called Black Earth. That uh, we did. Uh, it was like the old Arch Enemy lineup from the nineties, mm. and we did two new songs for Japan for a tour that we we're doing in two thousand nineteen. That was fun. We mixed. I mixed those with Frederick in his new studio. Frederick is a really interesting guy. You know, he was this. Um, he just kind of came up on my radar, you know, like for everybody else, you know, with Slaughter of the Soul and uh, By at the Gates and uh, the yeah. early Inflamed stuff, especially Inflamed, like the Subterranean, uh, I think it was Subterranean, like a mini C mini album. Yeah, the AP. Um, yeah. 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 And I snatched the drummer from the, the two good songs on that. That's Daniel Erland's on the drums there. So I snatched yes, that. Sir. I picked up him. <laughs> and then he was only like 18 or 19. And then, and then, uh, where the hell is this recorder? I checked, oh shit, it's that, it's that studio in Gothenburg. I want to go there, I want to record there. So that's where we did uh, Black Earth. And I remember showing up, you know, for recording Black Earth with Daniel and and uh, we tracked those. That, that album, first album, Black Earth, was recorded and mixed, I think, in nine days. Hmm. Completed. So that was like a very fast thing. But it was great. You know, it's just a, he, he was at the time, he was a very wild guy, you know. We drank a lot. We just record a lot and then go out and eat and party and then go over to the studio whenever. I just, I didn't have money for a hotel or anything. I just slept on the couch in the studio <laughs> or stuff like that. You know, it's just a, yeah. it was just like, you know, that kind of vibe, you know, in his early days, humble beginnings. But it was great, you know, and I felt I was, there was a lot of excitement. You know, I had been away from extreme metal after quitting Carcass in 93. So for me to come back in 95, at the end of 95, I was recording this. It felt like forever because I was still pretty young at the time. So it felt like I've been away from it forever. And uh, it was just super exciting to get back into that atmosphere and to, you know, Frederick really helped me shape that sound and put it together, you know. So he was a really important person for Arch Enemy in the beginning. We went back there a few times. So. Mm. But then, like everything, you know, the relation, we're recording relationships, you know, the relationship between producer or producer and engineer and, and band, you know, and it gets after a while, you think, like, ah, maybe we should try something new. Or, you know, we've done this, we're repeating ourselves because we found a formula in a way, you know, and then as a band, you're trying to break away from the formulas sometimes, you know, and you're going to try something a little bit different to see. Well, that sounds like, so that's when we started working with Andy Sneap in the UK. And then we did a few records with him and then we moved on to other people and stuff like that. We just basically produced the sluts. No, oh, well, it's worked. There's no doubt about that. You're many, many albums in. And look, given you, so you started the band way back in the day in the mid 90s. So I understand, mm -hmm. I could be wrong here, okay, but just listening to your interviews, it sounds like as though you started the band as a let's just see what happens type of deal. But because because realistically, yeah. I, I like Spiritual Beggars, great band. Realistically, you were well down the classic rock path. You were two albums in and your third one was on the horizon when Arch Enemy came out. So mm -hmm. was Spiritual mm -hmm. Beggars meant to be the band that you were potentially going to focus on? And does Arch Enemy a bit of a super group? I know it's been described as a super group, not by you, I don't think, but just a side project thing. <laughs> but then it just started to take off and you went, well, this is just where I'm going now. Well, for, and the, you know, when I started, when we, we did the Black Earth album, the first uh, Arch Enemy album, yeah, it was very much a case of just like, yeah, let's see, let's see where this goes. And not really much happened in the beginning, to be honest. We put it out on a very underground label. There was not not a lot, not a lot of, um, you know, got some good reviews here and there, but not a lot happened really. You know, there wasn't like a big wave of success or anything. 
Hmm. Um, apart from Japan, they really picked up on it. And they did, you got out licensed to a Japanese label and it got put out there and they, they put like a big push behind it and it did very, very well. And we actually went over there and toured over there on the first album. Hmm. And then that kind of energized us and gave us the motivation to make the second album. <laughs> And then we went back and toured in Japan again. And I was still just playing like a handful of shows in Europe. Nobody really talking much about Arch Enemy. We couldn't get tours really. Nobody wanted us. And then, because uh, this was the time, it was kind of a bad time for metal as well. It's all yeah. about rap metal, industrial metal. Uh, those kind of fusions were going on at the time, you know. That's all gone now, of course. But, you know, in new metal and all that kind of stuff. There's more, more natural, like people who do interviews, I remember for America or Europe, and they'd ask why we have so many guitar solos. And it would have been more natural if we had like a guy on the wow. turntable or something, you know what I mean? So it's just, a, it's kind of a weird time. So I've just, I just followed my, I followed on from what I'd done previously in practice, which is stay, I stayed within that form mat maybe, but you know, I, I even more melodic maybe in the guitar side of things. And, hmm even more solos and stuff like that. So I just followed what I like, you know, I don't really definitely didn't see Arch Enemy becoming like a, a big career band or anything like that at the time. It was just more, you know, just really being into it, loving that kind of music and having fun making it. And then uh, I was still doing Spiritual Beggars, of course, at the time. That was the bigger band at the time. We were touring with bands like Monster Magnet, Queens of the Stone Age. We did a lot of shows I made, and um, so it was happening for that band. You know, there was a lot going on with Spiritual Vegas as well. And for what, a few years, I was flip flopping between the two bands. You know, I was doing one record. If I wasn't in the studio with one band, I was on tour with the other, or vice versa. And you know, so it was just crazy. I was always busy doing something in that, those years. Mm. Um, and it was a very a lot of fun. You know. It's not sustainable in the long run, I guess. So, you know, at the end of the, then the singer of Spiritual Vegas quit and things kind of slowed down. We continued on to make records, but it kind of like didn't continue on such an intense schedule. And then mm -hmm. things started picking up with Arch Enemy and there was more interest in that. So I just kind of, okay, so I just followed, <laughs> followed that path, you know, and became more serious with, uh, with, uh, with Arch Enemy. Suddenly when Angela joined the band, it became more of a serious thing because then I thought she was from Germany and, you know, she was from another country and it's like, oh, shit, she's committing to be in this band. We better make something of it, you know, <laughs> go take this seriously, you know. Um, and we started, then we started booking tours all around the world. And of course, for the impact that the Wage of Sin album had, it, it just blew up, you know, and it became a very, very, it's a huge step up for us and we got to tour in the, more in the States and around Europe and getting festivals and of course keeping the Japanese market as well. And that actually got bigger, expanded, but um, yeah, that's when it released. Really, that, I would say that's around the time that Arch Enemy became the, the touring monster that we became and still are. Hmm. You, you've been described as the elder statesman of Swedish heavy metal. Okay, which is a huge. Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there, there's a whole, there's a, there's whole generations before me of uh, of metal people, Ingmar Malmsteen and you know, the Europe guys, and you know, there's a lot of hard rock and metal people that came before me from Sweden. Oh, no, look, no, no question but, yeah. about that. But the extreme metal thing, I yeah. mean, you, I mean, you're in Carcass, oh, yeah. okay? Yeah. And Carcass almost didn't write the yeah. book, but they certainly sure. wrote the first few chapters. And this is a couple of years before Slaughter of the Soul came out, which is really the zeitgeist. Yeah. And then everything sort of yeah. flowed on after that. But if hard work didn't happen, I say, I've, as I say, I've spoken to all these people and I've asked the questions, and nobody's denied that that hard work is really the genesis of what came after that started there. Mm. So, do do you feel? I mean, obviously you don't because of your response to the way that's I framed my point there. But can you understand why some people will see you in that light, though? Of course, yeah. I mean, I do in a way, <laughs> but uh, hmm. it's like a big, uh, yeah. But you know, I I enjoy. It's fun to look back, but you know, I try not to look do too much because I think that's damaging to. I'm more of a looking forward person, you know, or living in the moment and also thinking about the next tour or the next album, you know what I mean? Mm. That kind of stuff. I'm looking forward to going to Australia. 
next week, you know, so I'm super excited about that. So, you know, it's just, I've, and I've really been very fortunate. I'm of, of the generation that I am. I'm very fortunate that I'm still super active. I'm more active than I've ever been as a, I get booked more. I get, I get to play more shows than I've ever done in my life, you know, and this far into my career, you know, and then, then it's 27 years into Arch Enemy's career. Hmm. So it's super exciting, you know, maybe 28 years soon of Arch Enemy. So it's like, you know, it's not really, I never expected that, but it's just the way things have turned out. I think for some people, some artists, some musicians, of course, their heyday was maybe in the early nineties or the mid nineties. And then since then, then sort of things calmed down a lot and not a lot happened or big things didn't really happen for them. So then you have the time and maybe if you go back into a, more, a normal job, a normal routine, you have more time, you have a different perspective, if you know what I mean? You can think more about what was going on then and how exciting that was. And that was the time of their lives or whatever, you know? But I'm just kind of like, there's so many things that happen all the time in my life that I just keep, I don't have room for all the memories, you know? <laughs> I just yeah. move on to the next thing in a way, you know? I mean, it's... um I've been very fortunate to have this uh, longevity, you know. Of course, it could all end tomorrow, but who knows? I've enjoyed it so far. Yeah, and what a what a career! And and another aspect of your career, the one person that seems to have been able to get Charlie D'Angelo to bloody settle down and play in the one band <laughs> for longer than one or two albums. How, how did you manage that? Because he's, <laughs> he's famous for being in up to seventeen bands at one time. Yeah, no, he's calmed down a lot with that, I think. But I think he was just really, at a certain point in the 90s, he was very much, he was very eager to play with more people, try different things and stuff like that. But like I said, you know, around the way to the Sin album, we just made a big commitment, all of us. We said, this is it. No more standing, no more filling bass players, no more. You're either in or you're out, you know what I mean? And we made that decision. We... And he stood by that, you know, so Arch Enemy has been his priority band since then. Now, for all of us, it has been. Yeah, I can, I can see. Yeah, it's. Uh, it was really interesting to see that I spoke, when I spoke to Elisa a couple of years ago, I asked her what it was like playing with him because being a bassist, he's one of the guys, as you know. He's, he's in Merciful Fate and King Diamond and his bass lines are audible in a genre where they're often not. You can hear him playing and you can certainly hear it live. That's where it shines. But um, the the live shows too. So you mentioned that you're coming down to Australia the next week, I think, or the week after. So you're in Indonesia, I think, at the moment. How do how does Australia stack up against the rest of the world in terms of fan reaction and response to the new album? Oh, it's been phenomenal. I mean, it really has. Uh, it's a very different way of putting out this new album was the fact that what, what, the Deceivers album actually came out in August last year. Hmm. But on, upon the day of release, uh, we already had six new singles out. We had six songs off the album out as videos, as streaming singles and all that. So the, the you know, you could argue that people had already heard half the album. But also the, all those six songs were extremely popular with the fans and we could play them live and and we could really shine a spotlight on each individual on those singles, you know, and, and really, they really made their way into the live set list and the show and stuff like that. So very cool. I mean, it's just been an exciting time, you know, I'm just, it's adapt or die really nowadays, isn't it really, you know, it keeps changing. Every, every time we put out a new album, it seems the the landscape has changed just a, li a little bit, you know, how you do things nowadays and how to to get the music into the ears and hearts of the fans, you know, which keeps changing. And uh, we have a great team, you know, that support us working on that. You know, it's uh, lucky to have great management, great label and um, stuff like that, you know, because I don't really keep track of all of that. You know, I don't know. I'm more focused on the creative part. And of course, I'm, I'm involved on the business end to a certain degree, but really my heart lies in, in creating the music. And I'm also involved in the the production of it and then also like the merchandise and the and the you know designing stuff and things like that that's really what, what i'm into what i really enjoy the business part of it is just the uh, and the the, 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 with the strategies and the release strategies and stuff like that. It's just not something that i'm like it's great to see other people do that and see it all come together 
Yeah, well, you can you can fall down a deep hole with that one there if it's not your bag because it's that that social media marketing side of it for bands. Unless you've got the expertise that evidently Century Media and the big labels like that and Nuclear Blast can bring to the table, you're you're spending tens of thousands of dollars potentially for no reason if it's not targeted appropriately and the like. I wouldn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that actually that you focus on what what you know and what your absolute strength is because with a label like that behind you, it's just. I see. Yeah, and it's also the time, you know. I don't want to kill my inspiration, you know. I'm, and will, I'm still yeah. living my teen. I mean, in many ways, I'm still living my teenage fantasy. You know what I mean? I'm just, I, I just walk around and win a world full of my head in the clouds and we're full of riffs and metal. You know, I just think about stuff like that all day, mm. and that's my job, and that's what people want me to do. So I'm very, very fortunate in that way. You know, my job is to wake up, have coffee. And start playing guitar, you know, and that's great. I play guitar for hours each and every day. So, I mean, that's how cool is that? That's kind of like unbelievable, really, isn't it? Um, oh, it's the I dream. never thought that would be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I never thought that would be. I always thought that the music that I, when I started playing this music, you know, and the music that I was interested in that I wanted to play when I was a young, young teenager. I never saw that as something as a potential career or something like that, because there was that kind of music that I was interested in playing was not popular. A lot of a lot of times there was not even albums out with this kind of music. You know, it was before there were records. It would just be tapes and demos and live tapes and underground rehearsal, like rehearsal tapes of bands mm. from all over the world playing this extreme music. And that's what I was interested in. And then, of course, there were some established bands, but those was like small. You go and see these bands, and you think they were big, but there was nobody there. There'd be a hundred people there to see what you thought was an established band. And you, it kind of made you realize, like, shit, this music isn't that popular. You know, it's like not a lot of people are into it. And uh, but that all changed, you know, in the nineties. So it all kind of grew, and it became more of a business, you know, and it became more of a. I wouldn't say mainstream, but there was a way to market and sort of spread the that kind of underground metal and they became more of a, a scene for it. The scene became so much bigger, you know, and then, uh, I guess I saw that happening when I was in Carcass in the early nineties, you know, it just kind of like suddenly there'll be thousands of people at certain shows, you know, it's like, wow, this is really, mm. this is really something, you know, it's just, uh, how did this happen? How can so many people be in one spot at the same time, really enjoying this level of, noise <laughs> you know this kind of level of extremity that we were doing it was really interesting and to see it grow like that and of course now it's uh nowadays maybe people have expectations maybe if you start a band now if you're starting out now that it's going to leave some of that's going to be like a but you know what i mean there's an, i had no i had zero expectations of anything like this happening in my life i just thought that i always thought i would have a normal job and then I'll do music as a hobby, you know. But yeah, then it just turned out I've actually never been employed in my whole life. I'm properly employed, so I've always done this. So which is kind of crazy. I never, I never expected that. God had a plan for you from day one, from the sounds of things. <laughs> or is it or Satan? More the devil. There you go. <laughs> hey, I will. I will ask you this question. Sorry, if I, have we got time for one more question, or is, if, you, if you've got to head off, no drama. Sure, yeah, Wait, Alisa. Okay. She's a marketer's mm -hmm. dreamer. I mean, she looks like she should be on the front of Cosmopolitan or Clio magazine, you know, those those magazines. But she's she's a talent. She's the real deal. There's no question about that. So was she the only one you considered to replace Angela? Because they were bloody big shoes to fill, weren't they? Weren't they? Yeah, they were. But you know what? She brought her own shoes, which was cool, I thought. You know, she just kind of established herself fairly quickly as the new singer of the band and I think you know she's she's very talented and very creative and um, very serious about her craft and I have a, a lot of respect for her and um, I think that's we're very different you know people they're very different people in this band you know we're all different in our own way but we what we do have in common is that we respect each other and and what we all we each bring to the to the table you know to make our enemy work because I think without, you know, the wheels would fall off. It was all down to one person, but it's actually not. It's a lot of people. There's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes than people 
might know you know <laughs> a lot yeah. of people think i'm like the sole mastermind behind the hut i think maybe some people think that that's not true you know there's like for example daniel is a huge huge part of the band much more than just a drummer which is a phenomenal drummer he's a world-class drummer but he's also responsible for a lot of other things in the group you know that are creatively yeah. and uh, on a on a more sort of administrative level so i mean he's a great asset and they all are you know every, every member is great and like when it comes to the live set list you know that's charlie's he does the live set list so if people have any complaints go to him go to him. <laughs> <laughs> blame but yeah throw Ozzy on stage left i think he is isn't he from memory yeah throw, throw your uh throw your uh your, your mid-strength beers at the festivals are toward him not really but yeah you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's cool yeah um well it's I'll let you head off, mate. It's been a wonderful to finally chat with you. I, you know, I know you speak to hundreds of people through the year and you've got to press the flesh and do all these sort of things, but it is meaningful that you take the time out to have these sorts of chats and you share your perspective on things. Because I do, at, at my at my age now, I mean, I'm really intensely interested in the opinions that you have and um, the reasons why you started, why you keep going, and, you know, you've, you've eloquently answered what the future holds there throughout the conversation. So... You're one of the guys, Michael, there's no doubt about it. Without you, metal doesn't sound the way it does today, and I want you to know that. You know that metal did evolve, and it evolved through your – you're one of the people whose fingers that evolved through, so there you go. That's amazing, isn't it? Thank you. Hmm. No, very kind words. You can just keep talking stuff like that. I'm feeling great <laughs> about myself right now. <laughs> not everybody gets this, believe me. I, sometimes I'm, yeah, right? especially, yeah, I could, I'm, I'm not critical because it's not my job to do okay. that, but I do, I, you know, when when feedback and praise is, is worthy, and I know the problem is, Michael, and you, oh, God help me here, the metal media is so lowbrow. I'm actually a journalist, okay, so that's what I do during the day-to-day. And um, mm-hmm. so I'm trained is what I'm saying and trying to get to the bottom of things mm-hmm. is what I like to do. But a lot of the metal, mm-hmm. I do listen to some of your interviews and I'm like, have they even done any preparation for this? Do they know about your career and your history and what you've done and when you started and the fact that you you know, you, you, you grew up in two cultures effectively, even though it's all sort of pan-European these days. It's, uh, you know, do they mm-hmm. understand the, the perspective from where you're coming from? I just don't feel like people do the hard work, to be honest with you. So I, I try to make that my point of difference when I'm having a conversation. In some ways, I understand what you mean. And, but, you know, my career has been so long that I don't really blame if somebody's like, you know, in their early twenties to, and I'm doing an interview, I'm fine to talk about the new Arch Enemy album, you know, mm. or, but all the last 10 years, what we've done. But then, um, this, it goes so deep, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm like a Dracula or somebody, you know, I've just kind of been there forever, you know, <laughs> throughout the eons, you know, and I've just done so many different things for such a long amount of time that I just don't really, so the fact that I'm still kind of current and people still enjoy, people still buy tickets and want to hear what I've got to say musically, is just unbelievable to me. And I, I, I'm enjoying that as well, you know, so I, do, I can just enjoy every kind of um, chat that I have with people, you know, mm. I don't really, I don't really put the. I don't really feel that everybody has to know everything, my whole history in a way, you know. But it is cool. Once in a while, I talk to somebody like you, and then um, mm. that's awesome. Of course, it's really exciting. It's really uh, that makes me think as well, you know, like uh, you know about things. That's cool. Yeah, well, a great career, a long career, a long may you continue to perform. I'm going to try to get to your gig here at the Tivoli. There's no doubt about that. So, um, I'll try to get out there. It's just hard, so hard to get out with kids and work, and I'm also, you know, playing music on the weekends and stuff as well. So I've always got to check. And mm-hmm. usually, bands, gigs that I want to go to coincide with the gig that I'm playing at myself. So, um, but mate, if I if I'm there, I'm going to raise a beer and you're on. I put it that way. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate no worries. it. Yeah. Appreciate the talk. Appreciate the chat. Appreciate the opportunity. And uh, yeah, take care, mate. And I'll talk to you soon. What a fantastic conversation there. Like I mentioned in the introduction there, I felt like Michael was uh, prepared to give me some more time, but I had to jet off and take care of family stuff. All the parents out there, I'm sure, will understand. But uh, hopefully, I have another conversation and we can re- reprise many of the topics and dive even deeper. Now, if you loved that chat, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading because I've written a book. Click on the link in the banner on my website. You'll be taken to a marketplace, a marketplace of your choice, in fact, and you can download a sample. 
if you download the sample and you complete the purchase, not only do I appreciate it, but do hit me up because I want to thank you personally. And I've got some more information to share with you about the book in the moment. But before I do, my name's Andrew McKay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it's a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words, uh, sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.